Welcome everyone to our first Morbidity, Mortality, and Improvement Conference of the year. This is our first time trying this over Zoom, so please bear with us as we try to work out the format, but also keep it interactive for you. Before we get started, I just want to thank everyone who completed Dr. Narika's survey about your experiences having goals of care conversations at VCU. Uh, we really appreciated your feedback about the barriers you experienced, the resources, and maybe training that you need, and we used your input to help shape today's grand rounds. Um, as we go through the talk today, if you have additional questions, please feel free to use the chat feature. Uh, and if you would like more training about how to initiate these difficult talks with your patients, please also let us know that in the chat today and include your email. That information will be given to Dr. Narika at the conclusion of our grand rounds so that she can reach out to you. And as you can see here, the link to the survey is still open and will remain open if you'd like to give us feedback more anonymously. Please advance the slide. So our topic today, as you can see, our Morbidity, Mortality, and Improvement Conference is the power of difficult conversations, initiating discussions about goals of care. We're really lucky to have three uh, experts with us today. First, Dr. Mary Helen Hackney, as you know, is the Director of Quality and Safety for our Division of Hematology, Oncology, and Palliative Care. We also have Dr. Derek Liner, a hospitalist, co-chair of the Patient Safety Committee at the VA, and also our Associate Program Director for Quality and Safety for our training program. And of course, Dr. Danny Narika, our Medical Director of Inpatient Palliative Care Services and the Program Director for Hospice and Palliative Medicine Fellowship. Um, we're also very excited and grateful to have two resident volunteers with us today. Neha Hippel-Gaunker and Marina Sharif are both going to be part of our uh, panel discussion later this uh, session. Please advance the slide. So just briefly a reminder of the goals of our MMI conference. We'd like to learn from medical errors, complications, and unanticipated outcomes, or in the case of the cases we'll present today, we want to learn how we can better meet the needs of our patients and their families. We like to engage faculty and learners in a rational discourse surrounding a critical incident or near miss. We are always focused on diagnosing systems errors rather than identifying culpable individuals. And we want to increase transparency regarding organizational improvement efforts. Next slide. A brief reminder of the ground rules. These are more relevant for when we uh, meet in person, but just a quick reminder. Please avoid any finger pointing as you think through the case. Try to imagine that you are the physician or trainee involved in the case. Uh, we are always maintain confidentiality. So if you are aware of who was involved in this case or if you were yourself, you just keep that to yourself. Um, and also a reminder that we are focused on practical solutions. We wanna help discover fixes and ways that we can improve care for our patients. So again, please feel free to use that chat as we go through our session today to let us know your ideas about how we can improve care, especially for our patients at end of life. Next slide. Uh, so we'll briefly go through uh, an introduction to our topic today. As usual, we'll have a couple case presentations and then we'll reflect on missed opportunities in the patient's care. And then we'll briefly review what the literature says about this topic. In particular, what are the barriers we experience when trying to initiate goals of care conversations? We'll follow that up with a dialogue between our experts, uh, Dr. Narika, and two of our resident volunteers. And then uh, we'll have a presentation about health system efforts to address the needs of our faculty, trainees, and patients. Next slide. Our objectives today are to identify the benefits of early goals of care conversations and how to improve patient outcomes, to develop strategies to navigate these conversations effectively, we want for all participants to value their role in the patient's full continuum of care. And we'd also like each of you to be able to identify three resources at VCU that can help support you when you're initiating goals of care conversations. And with that, I'd like to hand it off to Dr. Narika. Thank you so much, Dr. Hardigan, and thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all about my favorite topic, one of them anyway. And before I turn it over to my colleagues who are going to tell you a little bit about cases, I wanted to get you in the mindset of realizing the opportunities that we have here to do things differently. 
I want to thank our program manager for making this slide out of my crazy ideas. But one of the things that occurred to me over the course of the pandemic is that we've all now gotten a little bit of the mindset of what maybe a little some of our patients and families go through as they try to go, go into these situations that are life altering for them. So I want you to think back to the beginning of the pandemic. And if you notice, there's, there's boxes and then there's thought bubbles. The boxes were what the scientists, the epidemiologists, uh, the folks who were really studying this said early on about this pandemic. It's going to be life altering. You're going to have to change what you do. Your kids may not be in school. Things will change dramatically. At the top, you can see Danny's thought bubbles, which do not align with science. Danny was in denial. My kid was gonna go to school. I was not going to have a major disruption in life. I was not going to make a plan for it. It was not a thing. So you can see over there in January and February, there was tons of data out there to suggest that we were going to have to majorly change things. And you can see it's not later on until April that I actually made a plan. So you can say I was the only one, but I bet I'm not. And if you all think back to your response, you might decide, gee, folks, and by the way, I'm a doctor, right? Theoretically, I listen to scientists. We had this information out there, but I did not assimilate it until much later on. Why did I do that? Well, because I'm human, and so are all of the folks we're taking care of. And by the way, this was not even a major threat to me, right? Like, I'm a lucky lady. My husband's an ER doctor. We have resources. We could fix this. This was a major inconvenience, yes, but it wasn't a threat. So I want you to take that mindset of how we sort of process things as human beings and apply it to those patients and families in front of you and the situations they're in and use that as your framework to work with them. Next slide, please. Because what I want to convince you of is that we have a bit of a timing problem and that some of the things that you see where we get stuck are because the rapid response team is behind me <laughs> in the doorway. So this, this, what you see in front of you is a serious illness conversation guide that was developed by the folks at Harvard and Ariadne Labs, um, which is a tool Gawande's think tank. You'll notice it's different than what you're used to. I'd like to talk, is it okay? How much information would you like to know? You let the patient guide this discussion. If we're in the hospital setting and if things are changing quickly, we can't do that. Next slide, please. The other thing that that then forces is that we have an intervention focus problem. I've included two sets of, of guides that are available to talk patients and families through serious illness conversations. You'll notice neither of them have anything to do with medical interventions. They have to do with who that human is. And that is actually what patients and families want to tell you about. But sometimes if we wait too long, we're focused very much on vents and resuscitation and dialysis machines and patients and families get overwhelmed. I think we have some opportunities to do this differently. Next slide, please. I have some slides and you can keep clicking. Um, by the way, big props to my colleagues in uh, PI who make some really beautiful slides. I'm going to quickly run through some data slides. This same issue that I just identified actually appears in a lot of these. So this is our mortality strategy. Um, obviously, we've been working on that as a health system. There are patients in here who didn't have conversations before coming to the hospital, and because of the timeline, they wound up, they wound up passing away in the hospital. Next slide, please. In addition, there are patients where we have opportunities to say, wow, can we discharge them to hospice? Well, we could, but we didn't get to the, the conversation in the clinic, and then we didn't get to it in the hospital. Next slide, please. We are noticing that we're working on, I just showed you the, the hospice discharge data, so we're working on that, but one of the things you'll see in this slide is that on the internal medicine side of things, yes, we discharge more patients to hospice, but remember, some of them could have probably been managed without being admitted to the hospital, right? So we did discharge them to hospice while they were here, but we may have had an opportunity to get them into hospice without coming in the hospital. And that, that's something we should be working towards. Next slide, please. We are starting to identify these patients now that we've stratified the, the code status orders. I can kind of tell from a distance what some of the quote unquote major buckets of care for these patients are. 
Uh, but I would tell you, we get a little stuck for those DNAR, DNI patients where we kind of stop there and we don't continue with those conversations. And you can see kind of in the next data set, thank you for, uh, to Christine for uh, doing that from Dr. Bowling's shop. You can see that some of those patients don't get discharged with hospice and their readmission rate is 40%. So all of these things that we're seeing in the hospital are tied together, and they're kind of tied to some of these same issues we'll, we'll talk about today. So with that, I will ask us next slide to think a little bit about what if we approach communication with seriously ill patients another way, and I'll turn it over to my colleagues for case review. Thank you. Thank you. This is Mary Helen Hackney. We're going to, you know, we always learn best from patients. So we're going to present a couple of cases that will hopefully keep stimulating that idea about talking to patients early on about what's going on. So the case I'd like to present today is a 63-year-old male. He was diagnosed with chronic myelogenous leukemia in 2000, treated elsewhere with the usual trio of drugs, Gleevex, Brysol, Tisigna. Uh, we have very few records. He transformed to acute lymphoblastic leukemia per history in February of 2019. He was hospitalized where he lived treated with uh, prosidopenias, transfusions, and fever. And then family arranged for him to travel to Richmond, to VCU, to Massey Cancer Center, to look for treatment options. We're looking for that next hope. Next paragraph, All right, next slide. Um, he, the day he arrived in Richmond, he presented to the emergency department with back pain and shortness of breath. He had a white count of 30,000, 81% blast, uh, hemoglobin low at 9.6, platelets at 46,000. He clearly was in blast crisis and clearly had acute leukemia. He was admitted to our inpatient hematology service with that diagnosis. Next slide. Uh, past medical history, uh, not uncommon, diabetes, uh, pleural effusions due to one of his drugs, uh, a variety of cardiac issues, including atrial fib, coronary artery disease, pulmonary hypertension, and a lot of chronic back pain. He was not actively using tobacco or alcohol at this time, although he did have a past history. He had been a working man all his life. Uh, we were able to communicate well in English with him, which is important. Next paragraph. Next slide. Um, so he was admitted from the emergency room. The diagnosis was confirmed that he had Philadelphia positive acute leukemia, ALL, presumed as a transformation. He was started on chemotherapy, as would be appropriate, then Christine dexamethasone, intrathecal methotrexate, because this has a high risk of CNS uh, uh, involvement. And he was later discharged with a blast count that had dropped from 30, 40% down to 8%, so showing response, and was started on panatid, panatidinib, I can never say it, panopinib, there we go, uh, as his treatment. Next slide. Uh, over the next month, so this is June through the summer, uh, he had multiple clinic visits monitoring lab work. There was discussion in the beginning of evaluation for a bone marrow transplant, but he did have a lot of other medical problems and there was some concern about financial coverage as well. Uh, July, he had an admission for a pulmonary embolus and atrial fib. August, he had uh, more issues going on cardiac wise. September, more cardiac issues with evaluation. And uh, in September, he had an oncology clinic visit. And even though his lab numbers looked good when they did the molecular testing, he had the presence of the Philadelphia chromosome in his blood. So technically he had a molecular relapse. They were making arrangements to get a bone marrow biopsy, but transportation and the need to maintain anticoagulation complicated that. Next slide. Uh, so the, the Admission of question was October 2019. The previous day, he had had a right heart cath to evaluate the pulmonary hypertension. It was labeled as mild, but the next day he showed up in our emergency room again with back pain, nausea, blurry vision, falls. His white count had skyrocketed to 37,000 with 74% blast. So he was a treatment failure on uh, his previous medication. He was admitted again for blast crisis and tumor lysis uh, with that high number of blasts. Uh, hydroxyurea was started. Uh, he had a bone marrow biopsy done to assess the degree of relapse. Uh, continued to have back pain 
and by day three was uh, frequently triggering both sepsis alerts and other alerts for um, uh, patient challenges, uh, tachycardia, uh, and uh, changes in blood pressure. He was started on hydroxyurea, uh, but that uh, failed to control his counts and his counts kept rising. Uh, he had a sepsis alert on day four. He had an RRT alert. Next slide. On day five, he had three significant events uh, triggering between hours of four and midnight. Uh, the last one was a RRT for confusion, a fall, and hallucinations. This was attributed to medication. Uh, day five and six uh, had another event and ended up coding, uh, was found apneic and unresponsive without a detectable pulse. There were three resuscitation efforts. Uh, it was uh, presumed that he had alveolar hemorrhage because when he was intubated, there was blood and clot. His son was present with the um, arrest and after the third essentially event during the code uh, said, stop, let's make the patient DNR. Uh, and uh, at that point he was intubated. He was transferred to the me uh, uh, medical respiratory ICU. Uh, and family came to say their goodbyes before he subsequently passed away. Next slide. So in retrospect, could we have done something different? Uh, the reason this, this case triggered uh, presentation is because we started seeing a gentleman decline over several days with multiple sepsis alerts, yellow alerts, uh, multiple rapid response uh, alerts, and it was brought up by staff as have we been having those conversations. Um, and so there were several opportunities. There was an opportunity when he first came here in May. Uh, did he know his full prognosis? When we started him on the um, panaptinib, that only has about a 34% chance of remission. Did he fully understand that? Uh, bone marrow transplant was his best opportunity but he was unlikely to get that for a variety of reasons. Um, on his last admission, when he comes in and relapse, ideally that would have been a great time at that time to have a goals of care discussion because he had an early relapse. Next slide. So in this particular gentleman, some of the things that we think about, he's a poor prognosis for acute leukemia. And that's actually been one of our triggers that Dr. Sajal Patel is gonna be starting a goals of care discussion as part of the workup uh, with new diagnosis AML in the what's called the elderly patient. And I don't think 60 is elderly, but we have to live with that number. Uh, poor prognosis, uh, relapse in less than one year from first diagnosis is never good. Multiple medical issues. When we reviewed the chart, we realized that many people had brought up, we have discussed goals of care but no one had actually written down what those goals of care were. So you have to infer that that's full code and continued treatment. Uh, and again, the reason we sort of brought this case up is in those last days with a very ill gentleman, multiple uh, situations where we were aware that he was declining and a lot of resuscitation efforts and did we do the right thing by him? I will say as a specialist, it's always okay to ask another specialist if you're not sure the prognosis or what the treatment options are because that can help in decision making. So this is an inpatient. Uh, I'm going to turn the next case over to Dr. Derek Liner. Um, he's going to do an outpatient uh, case. Um, I put the slide in there when asking for a miracle sometimes we don't recognize what that miracle is and recognize that this family came for this first case came to the U.S. Uh, they brought the patient to uh, well Puerto Rico is U.S., came to Virginia hoping for that miracle of uh, curing his cancer, uh, but the miracle may be different. Dr. Liner, you have another case for us about an outpatient situation. Thank you, Dr. Hackney, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to share um, my case from a time that was actually on the inpatient teaching uh, setting, but this uh, patient did go in and out of ambulatory versus inpatient over his uh, course, as you'll see. So this is a 63-year-old gentleman, had uh, previously diagnosed squamous cell carcinoma of the left upper lobe, had been diagnosed six months prior before I had met him. 
His treatment up to that date had included uh, chemo um, and then switched to uh, drivolumab for every two weeks after he'd finished his first chemo radiation cycle. His diagnosis had been complicated by meds to the ribs, to the pleura, and there was definitely evidence of um, spread to the hydrolymph nodes on recent PET scan. His treatment had been complicated by severe rib and esophageal pain, um, and he had experienced significant weight loss over the most recent three months. Um, he had, up until the, about a week before coming into the hospital, had been uh, compliant with his chemo and his palliative radiation. Uh, but at the most recent HEMOC appointment, he had declined further treatments due to his intolerance. Um, next slide, please. Some pertinent histories. He was already under surveillance for prostate cancer. Um, he lived with his spouse uh, and his daughter, both of whom were nurses, uh, was a current uh, uh, quarter of a pack a day smoker. You can see the, uh, on the medication list uh, the aggressive attempts at pain control that are already being employed over the last several months for this patient. Next slide, please. So the three, day, three days before he came into my service, um, he was seen in clinic. Uh, despite having a CT evidence of good treatment response because of intolerance to the, to the um, chemotherapy, he was declining further treatment. Um, at that appointment, he was already showing sort of uh, ongoing weight drop, a slight confusion. Labs that day showed hypercalcemia and a little bit of a leukocytosis um, and a suspected reactive um, thrombocytosis. And the outpatient team decided to give fluids, uh, which helped him a little bit, so he was sent back home. He came back to urge, uh, urgently uh, three days later um, with uh, worsening fatigue and confusion, was having subjective fevers, really not eating anything at all at home, had some progressive dystia, and the uh, pain was um, still severe and ongoing. His white count was turning up slightly. A chest x-ray in clinic showed that he had a left uh, pleural fusion, a near complete left lung volume loss, and so he's admitted to my service for further management of uh, confusion, leukocytosis, and the new effusion. Next slide. Over the course of the next day, um, you know, he didn't have any additional fevers. His white cell normalized without additional treatment or antimicrobials. Uh, pulmonary was consulted to perform a thoracentesis, which returned about a liter of bloody fluid, um, which was presumed to be um, malignant. Uh, he was, our, and family were already asking to leave, and he was uh, hemodynamically and, and from lab standpoint doing better, and so we did discharge him home for a close hemonc follow-up. Later that evening, our, our um, dorosynthesis labs returned uh, showing a significant infection in that space. And so we called him back for a chest tube placement and we started empiric vancomycin and zosin. Um, over the next couple of days, his cultures remained negative. Uh, he was feeling well. We were able to remove the chest tube and transition to augmentin. Next slide, please. Uh, as his symptoms improved, he started to request to leave. Um, and um, uh, we discharged him with a close follow-up with hemonc the very next day. Uh, within 24 hours, he was being brought back in urgently to Hemonc for significant rapid worsening of his mental status, and, uh, which included incontinence. His lab showed a, a return of an AKI as well as rapid progression of hypercalcemia and was admitted back to my service for um, a hydration. It was the next day that we decided to start having goals of care conversations. Uh, Powdive was consulted and he was discharged uh, home to hospice the following day. Next slide, please. And so the theme, as we're sort of exploring here, is I, I feel like there are multiple opportunities for us to um, start having goals of care conversations with, with this gentleman, especially with his statement of no further treatment, uh, even before he was coming into the hospital. Um, I think this is important because at firsthand, we were witnessing, most importantly, the stress that these readmissions were having on him and his family. Uh, but certainly the clinicians over his care were, were witnessing uh, this gentleman worsen and um, the readmission certainly having strain on the system as well. Uh, next slide, please. As I was reflecting about my experience in this case, um, some of the um, personal factors that I think delayed my having the goals of care with the patient early um, were that I felt like I didn't know him well enough. Um, the patient had better relationships, I thought, with his primary oncologists. Um, I sometimes see myself as a temporary doctor in hospital medicine, um, and did the goals of care conversation really, uh, was it more appropriate for the, the practitioners with the longitudinal relationships to be, to be having that conversation? Um, at many institutions, uh, like the VA where I work, um, we do not have a dedicated hemonc floor, and so um, hospitalist medicine is the primary service for a lot of the patients with oncologic issues. Um, and I do sometimes experience that imposter syndrome of not really knowing much about um, secondary, uh, second line therapies for um, uh, you know, different types of cancers. And so um, I felt like I didn't know about his situation and maybe uh, would be stepping on toes if I um, offered goals of care too early when there may be other options from uh, the oncology team. And then 
Importantly, the last admission, uh, he was confused and I was worried that he wouldn't actually be able to participate in a goals of care conversation. Next slide. So I thought it was uh, important to try to explore the literature to see um, what patient uh, specific, um, clinician specific and system specific barriers do exist when trying to initiate these goals of care. Uh, next please. I was able to find one group um, who surveyed, uh, created a survey um, to explore uh, a perceived importance of different barriers in initiating goals of care conversations. Next. They reported their um, work in JAMA in 2015, and as you can see, next please, most highly, uh, what's rated as most highly important are more family-centric and patient-centric um, uh, barriers. So the top three being family members' difficulty with accepting the level of, uh, or the, the, ones, the loved one's prognosis, family members' difficulty understanding the prognosis or treatment plan, and lack of agreement amongst family members. It's not until you go about halfway down the list you start to see the importance of some of those systemic or personal factors like uh, uncertainty in estimating prognosis or lack of time in, in having that conversation. Next, please. The same group then changed their survey to explore that question in the inpatient cardiology environment, and you see the exact same pattern. Much more highly rated are the uh, uh, patient-centered um, factors. Next, please. Uh, it is down the list again that you're seeing the um, healthcare team disagreement or uncertainty amongst the healthcare team uh, in estimating prognosis or lack of time is showing up as important barriers. Next. Another group was more recently looking at um, physicians in the ambulatory oncology setting uh, and found a very similar pattern. Again, they, they separated this out in their, in their report uh, looking at specific categories of patient-centric, uh, physician-specific, or sy systems. Uh, this is their patient, li uh, patient barriers list, and uh, the same theme is there, the top things being uh, patient's difficulty in understanding the prognosis or accepting the prognosis or family member's disagreement in having the conversation. Next, please. As you look at the physician barriers and uh, external or system barriers, you see, again, some of those personal uh, things that we talked about, uh, desire to maintain hope, uncertainty of prognosis, uh, or lack of time. Again, if you can remember kind of the last slide, they're rated less important than the others, but they are, they are showing up there. A more, uh, next slide please. A more recent um, study was a systematic review from Australia looking in the general practice setting. Uh, next please. And they were looking at the number of studies that showed uh, certain barriers. And it, when, when they approached the um, question this way, you see that there were uh, more of those systemic barriers that were showing up. So lack of time, lack of PCP knowledge, um, and then the lack of patient knowledge were kind of the top three. Next, please. It's highlighted there. One of my um, academic interests is really in decision-making as it applies to patient safety. And as I looked at this data and noticed across several articles that same pattern of the patient-specific factors being more highly rated, I had to wonder, do we undervalue because it is a complex situation and a complex conversation, do we undervalue uh, the biases that we have in having that conversation and the systemic uh, factors that may play a role in, in supporting us in that, having that conversation? Uh, so I think it's important for us to hear kind of what the experience is locally. Um, and I'd like to turn it over to um, two representatives from our residency class who are on the front line of patient care, uh, Dr. Shreve, Dr. Hippo um, So I'll turn it over to you guys and uh, Dr. Narika who will facilitate that conversation. So oh, I thought they were just gonna do it. <laughs> <laughs> Come on up, ladies. All right, please give a virtual round of applause for our residents who very kindly volunteered to get up here um, and talk with me a little bit, which is always a daunting task. Um, so thank you ladies for being here today. And we just wanted to do briefly, um, as we discussed at the beginning, thank you to Dr. Hardigan and her team for putting together that survey, that's awesome, um, and sending it out to everyone so we could have feedback. A lot of you responded. A lot of you actually put comments in and put questions and barriers you've seen. Thank you so much for that. We've selected just a couple here today to sort of talk about. There's many more. I promise I'll be back. Um, one of the reasons we wanted to do this is because if, if I sat down with, with you and we explored the two cases that Mary Helen and Derek were, were kind enough to bring forward a little more, and, and I know this because I do this for a living, what we would find is, well, the family wasn't here, and if this person, and the, the patient didn't tell me about this, and there was, you know, they had an insurance barrier here, 
we tend to focus very much on each individual patient and those interactions and how those impacted care. But if we really want to sort of at a system level make this better, and that's why I made you all focus on the system and not individual patients in that survey, we have to start looking at the system. And I think it's really easy in the day to day when you're seeing each individual patient to get just focused on the individual factors. But what I would love your help with is for you to stop maybe looking at those individual factors, because let me just tell you the punchline, humans are complicated. But then we can look at, okay, but if we didn't have those individual factors, what are the system barriers that got us here? And there are a lot of them, but we're really committed to trying to work on them. So we're gonna start with Neha first. Thank yes. you for being here, we You're appreciate welcome. it. Um, so I'll ask a little bit, because both of you very kindly volunteered, as far as I know, nobody, <laughs> nobody volunteered you up here, um, to, to come up here and talk a little bit about this. Can you tell me a little bit about the experience that drove you to say, yeah, I'll, I'll come and talk a little bit about what I've seen? Yeah, so I am reaching, I'm in my last year of my internal medicine training, um, and this kind of struck me a little bit just because I was reflecting on my own you know, interaction with patient care and recognize that in my own primary care clinic at the VA, I've never once actually held a goals of care discussion with any of my patients. Um, and I kind of was thinking of why that is, um, especially being on the other side of it too, when I'm inpatient and dealing with complicated patients and kind of wishing that this had already been established. Um, so I think, you know, I was thinking of why that was, and I think the onus is on me a little bit too for my own, you know, sense of lack of confidence in having those discussions. Um, but kind of me recognizing also that when I did have patients who were admitted to the VA, who got sick and, you know, had a bad outcome, I almost had a sense of guilt. Like I kind of wish that I had seen that coming or I had taken that ownership myself to kind of have that discussion um, with the patient, with the family in a controlled setting to, you know, avoid that sort of situation. So trying to understand why that is on my own, but also like from a systems perspective, like you said. Yeah, thank you for that. And I really appreciate you being honest about that because I think sometimes that's not uncommon for folks to have that reaction, but it's hard to talk about. So I think a lot of folks are working, walking around with it internally. Um, and that part of that, um, that reaction to it allows you to have the energy to help us overcome a little bit of the system barriers. And I will say that looking at the list of concerns that you all brought up, this was actually one of the most common ones where it was, I really wish that there was some sort of structure, timing, process, education to do this outpatient but I wasn't sure even where to start, so I didn't, and now I feel badly. And we don't want you to feel badly. We, we have to set up the system so that you can feel empowered to do this, and that's what we're here to do. So I think you did some reflecting, and you went back, and, and you had, like, the Narika effect, and you went and started, like, <laughs> messing around with things there. What did you find that might be, at least in the VA setting, something you could start with? Yeah, so what I didn't know about, and thankful for my primary care attendings, um, Dr. Fox in particular, who was talking me through it, was there's actually already a measure implemented within the VA system called a CAN score, a care assessment needs score. And essentially what it does is it looks at all of the patient data based off of you know, how old a patient is, comorbidities, number of ER visits, okay. readmission rates, certain medications, um, and then from there kind of calculates a score that kind of helps predict their morbidity and mortality. So kind of brainstorming it with my attendings at the primary care clinic, we had talked about, well, what if, you know, from a system perspective, some sort of notification that we do get, which we, we do have reminders in our CPRS system, that would alert us that this patient has reached a certain threshold in that score. Um, and maybe that's a time where we should then recognize that it's on us to start having those conversations with the patients and their families. That's perfect. And I think for those of you who work at VCU, this will probably come to a town near you at some point uh, via Epic. But yes, like when you're looking at a complicated patient, there's a whole list of things, but having a little bit of a prompt to sort of refocus on the whole picture and then having a plan of what to do with it, which is the next step, happy to keep talking, um, I think is important. And I think for all of you out there who are practicing, um, especially in subspecialty clinics, I know that, and please oncology, um, Derek and Mary Helen found two oncology cases for us, but there, there are opportunities in all spaces. We're, we're all opportunity here. 
But if you're taking care of patients with serious illness and you're, you're sort of starting to see some of these things um, in your clinic, but you're not sure what to do about it, please reach out to me. We're trying to, you know, we've had some conversations with Dr. Sign. We're trying to figure out what we can do to start reaching our outpatients because I think we all realize that, yes, we do want that to be part of our system. We don't want you to feel like you're out there on your own and you really do want to do something, but you don't even know where to start. Thank you so much. Yeah, for that. you're welcome. Raina, it's your turn now. Yeah. Oh, look, and you changed the picture and everything. <laughs> you guys should travel around with me. Yeah. So um, one of the reasons I volunteered for this was I noticed during my intern year, throughout the year, um, I was the person seeing the patient a lot throughout the day. Um, and in my limited experience, I didn't feel like I had the appropriate tools to make a prognostic assessment. Um, I felt like my attending or um, specialists could be better involved with that. So I want to know how to better, you know, engage them and then what I can do to facilitate those goals of care discussions since I'm also the person who might be talking to the patient multiple times throughout the day and what I can do to get my patient closer to being ready to have those discussions. Awesome. And I think that is another great question. And actually, um, what I loved about the way you kind of introduced why you know you kind of volunteered to be up here is that it actually aligns with two of the questions that came in and again there there's an poor, poor dr hardigan sat and typed out like a two-page list of questions um, to organize us but there's there's two themes in there and again that's what the other thing i liked was you were focused out patient you were focused inpatient because it's going to take the whole thing right we have to do the whole thing together um, so the first thing that that we want to kind of acknowledge is that and, and I think Derek also outlined this too. I don't know this person very well. I am concerned about where they are, but how do I know when it's time? Or is it, should I bring this up now? Um, something I hear frequently is, are we ready for palliative? Is the patient and family ready for palliative and that sort of thing? Um, one thing I will tell you about the readiness for palliative is you don't have to be ready for me. I will make myself ready for wherever the patient and family is, right? So wherever they are, that's where I will meet them. And then my job is to walk them to wherever they need to be. Uh, but I think when you're looking at folks in the hospital and you don't have that background, it can be kind of overwhelming. And I think Mary Helen and I think a lot of our subspecialists here have a similar approach um, to kind of saying, hey, if my patient's there and you're not sure where things are going or you need more feedback, let me know. Um, and I think engaging in that and trying to, because one of the things was mentioned multiple times is that barrier of time. And that's, that's the thing I can't magic away, right? That is a big system barrier that we're going to have to be really, really, um, really, really creative with. That one's a tough one. But what we do need to do, we focus a lot on patient family communication, and then we forget that there's a lot of team communication that creates the space to have mm -hmm. these conversations. So I do encourage you to reach out to the subspecialists that are caring for those patients so that they can give you input. Um, if they're able to integrate into those meetings, sometimes you find that a lot of them volunteer to do that if we can all plan. And we have to give resources for that too. So I think we've worked a lot with Irene's team and care coordination to how can they integrate in that process, help us plan things, time things, corral family members. All of that is hard to do sometimes. Uh, because I think that input is crucial. Um, and I think those relationships that already exist are important to the patients and families. But one thing I also wanted to highlight, because there was another question, I just want to make sure I'm reading it right. What do I do when the patient and family say they're not ready? Mm -hmm. That is a super common question. And when you identified sort of why, why you wanted to kind of participate in this, um, one of the things that I would sort of reflect back to you is you, you all take the time to sort of be able to be in that patient's room and make a relationship with them. Yeah. And I think one of the things that's really important as we go to have these discussions, especially if we are in the inpatient setting, it's a little different on the outpatient setting, right? There's pros and cons to everything. In the outpatient setting, you may have a little bit more of a pre-existing relationship. On the hospital side, we may not, mm -hmm. but we don't, always we don't always leverage the relationships we do have. Yeah. So we have house staff and we have nurses and we have social workers and we have others who actually do spend quite a bit of time with mm -hmm. patients and families at times. Um, and those relationships can actually sometimes help us have these conversations. Because yeah. sometimes the person who's coming in need 
they may not know me to have that conversation. And I think you very nicely, the first time you laid this out for me, kind of described that when you've seen some of the family conversations, it's been the patient sort of eyeing you, even though there's a specialist and an attending doctor with them. And they're eyeing you because you've become a bit of a support for them, right? So I do encourage everyone um, to sort of, we haven't structured this as well to use networks here to provide this care, but I really encourage you all, there's a lot of folks around who can help have these conversations and be the supports for patients and families. Some of them are here like all the time, they just live here, uh, and are always happy to help. Um, Let's engage on that level because all of those levels are necessary to sort of do that difficult work, which is having these really challenging conversations. All right. Thank you, ladies, so much for being willing to do this. I really appreciate it. it. All right. Okay, and we'll finish up a little bit on the system. And I'll invite Dr. Rebe. You're not going to let me sit here alone, are you? Dr. Hardigan is going to fire me from ever doing this again. Okay. (laughs) So now that we've identified that there's a lot of opportunities, we really don't want to leave you thinking, well, gosh, what on earth am I ever going to do about all of this? Um, It's really important that we talk a little bit about what we've already done and what we still can do, but we're all going to need to work together on. Next slide, please. So there's a list of things that are here. There are absolutely more things than this. This is not exhaustive. This is where we've started. There's a whole lot that yet can be done. Um, And what I'm asking for is your partnership to help me identify what those things are. I have been around in the system for a while. I do tend to look for opportunities. Everybody's afraid when I start using that word. But there's still things that I don't know about or I haven't seen. And there's fixes out there that I may not be aware of, um, like Neha just just illustrated. So I think it's really important that we make this a conversation that continues. Uh, For those of you who are looking for me to tell you how to sort of take care of all these patients individually. I will give you my email address at the end and you can email me and learn more about serious illness conversations and training. Uh, But this is a bit of a systems level approach here because of the timing of of our uh, meeting. Next slide. So let's look at a couple of these in detail. We talked about earlier conversations. I've already talked a little bit about through each of this, why we want to do that. But the other thing is when you do those great conversations, we have to be able to find it, right? I think you're all aware that sometimes you all write beautiful conversations and a progress note from an inpatient stay, and then they get discharged and they come back to the ER and nobody knows that it happened, right? That's a system error. That is a system problem. We can fix that, and we will if it kills me. Um, But just think, if you're standing in the emergency room and you don't know Ms. Smith and she just came in, I want you to think of what the difference is in that top box. So there was a prior DNR order, and that's all you know. And then that bottom box, that patient has three forms. They're all consistent. Her decision maker was part of all those conversations, and we know all of that stuff that's in that paragraph next to it, it's attached to the forms in the EMR. You just click on it, and it's there. That's a mind-blowing difference. That's how it should be. For patients and families, you really know what they want. If you're going to come down to the ER and see them, we should know all of that, and that's where you start with their care. It shouldn't start over again every time we see them, especially if we're going to start moving these conversations to the outpatient space. We really need you all, if you're doing these great conversations, to be able to find it and find it quickly. And we need to see in chronological order. These conversations will change over time. We need to be able to track what the outcomes are. Next slide, please. Obviously, I'm from palliative care, so I'm going to make a plug for palliative care because that's what I do, right? Um, So briefly, um, we do need more palliative care here. Does it work? Yep. Um, And... There's obviously national data. This is data from here, just in case you wanted to see our own patient populations. We have more penetration in Hemonc than we do in any other specialty currently. And because of that, if you look at the difference between the bars, not only does palliative care improve um, what the outcomes are um, utilization-wise, and by the way, utilization tends to follow quality of life for these patients. Uh, But also, if you look at early versus late, by the way, (laughs) Early was greater than 90 days. So it's not like tons and tons of time, it's three months. Um, You can see that there's a significant difference in utilization even just with that. So that's a big deal. Next slide, please. 
but we need a better model. And that's what I've been trying to drive home a little here. And this is what I hope we really get to work on in our health system over the next several years is building that structure for all patients with serious illness where they are outside of outside of this hospital. We have built a system where you will get the care, you will get these conversations and transitions in the hospital. We need to move that process outside of the hospital to get the outcomes that we all want. Next slide, please. In order to do that, you guys have to be able to have access to things when patients are outside of the building, right? Because, um, and you know, people call me now all the time, which is amazing, please keep calling me. But, you know, the question is, I have this patient in my clinic, can you help me? And there's barriers to me helping you. Well, darn it, I don't like that, right? Because then that patient's gonna wind up in the ER and admit it, I know it, right? Because, and that's all system errors, right? We didn't build out the system for that not to happen. Is that what the patient and family wants? Most of the time, no. I know when we get to the ER, everybody's frustrated, right? Patient and family are, we are because we have to admit them. The ER has no beds, they are completely frustrated. We can do this a different way, but we have to build it. One of the things I wanna highlight about this too is that sometimes we get in the mindset because we see things that it's the only way to do it. So I, I've written there next to that little house that you can admit to GIP, to inpatient hospice from home. You can totally do that. If that patient and family know they want to be in hospice and they just need symptom management because things are out of control, they don't have to go to the ER. They don't have to be admitted to medicine first. They can be straight put in an inpatient hospice on our service. And that's not a readmission, by the way, just in case you were tracking insurance games. So I really want to encourage us to think about how to do this better in the future because the way we do it now the way that you all think the system works is because that's what you've seen but it doesn't have to work that way we can make it different next slide please one thing i'd like to highlight about that and one place we've all we've set you all up for failure and it's funny because people will like pull me off to the side in the hallway and be like danny i don't know how to refer an outpatient to hospice Shh. Like, I know you don't because we didn't set you up for that. Like, there is nothing for that. That's a total setup, right? That's a system failure. And off to the left, um, poor PI, like, they hate this slide. I keep bringing it up. But it's important that you can't even just, like, type in hospice as a referral so I can't get data. You have no idea what to do if you don't happen to run into me to tell you. This is, like, a big deal that should be a simple thing, right? So in Epic, if it kills me, there will be an order just to refer to hospice. And then that has to go somewhere, right? Because how are you supposed to keep track of what, what places in Richmond do inpatient hospice at the current moment, which by the way, we lost both of the other ones in April. Poof, they just went away. Um, what hospices we have relationships with, how those relationships work, that's too much for you all to keep track of on top of everything else you're doing. We should be here, we should build that in, it should be, there should be an easy button for this. You should be able to say, I have a patient and I need help and that should be it, right? Those are all system flaws. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm back with my forms, nobody's surprised. However, you will start seeing this post form. I have physician volunteers now, so we're gonna start doing these. And also care coordination, by the way, can also be trained. Um, so care coordinator social workers can actually do training and do the post form with folks. So you will start seeing these in the environment. We are here to be resources. On the left is the purple DNAR wristband you have probably started to see uh, yesterday in the environment. Um, I do wanna highlight that there's, these systems are more complicated than you might have given it credit for before. And I have my colleague over here, Dr. Rave, who's a palliative surgeon. Uh, to explain a little bit about one of the areas that we have gotten stuck on um, this past week. So it seems like a straightforward concept, right? We put a purple armband on when you have a DNAR order, except when you try to go for surgeries and procedures and then everybody decompensates in procedural areas this week. Sorry to you all, uh, but we're gonna help you. So I just want to have her spend a couple minutes on how that flow is supposed to work and what we can do to kind of help support that. And we can go to the next slide for that. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Emily Rabe. I'm a, <laughs> I put a surgeon in medicine grand rounds. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've snuck into your meeting and, and thank you for letting me uh, participate. Um, so I'm a colon and rectal surgeon. I'm also a fellowship trained uh, by the group here and board certified in palliative care. And uh, really my main uh, area of focus is improving quality of care for seriously ill surgical patients. 
And here are the population that we've been focusing on uh, just to have a population to identify kind of at the outset is patients with DNR status undergoing procedures and surgeries. And I should say that the current policy that we have here at VCU is aligned with the best practice guidelines from the American College of Surgeons and the American Society of Anesthesiologists. But uh, over time in the past, there's been a general lack of awareness of the existing policy as well as what currently the consensus is for best practice. So as you can see on this slide, um, in general, there's been a uh, there have been a lot of missed opportunities to identify patients as DNAR prior to undergoing surgeries and procedures. But very importantly, uh, of those patients that are identified, a substantial portion does prefer to maintain their DNAR throughout the surgery. So it is not correct to assume that most patients want to automatically rescind their DNAR for a procedure or surgery. Um, this has now gotten much more complicated with the purple wristbands in the environment because we have come from a place where we believe the care provided to the patient should match the order and also match their wristband status, which means that if a patient is rescinding their DNAR for a procedure or surgery, the order needs to be changed in the electronic health record and then it needs to be changed back. And we're working on creating a structure for this. Um, I'm sure it'll change over time and we're very open to feedback and trying to identify any potential pitfalls that occur because as you can see, we're starting with a process that was already not optimized before the purple wristbands were integrated into patient care. Uh, but one of the main things I want you all to know is that there is now a surgical palliative care virtual pager, which ta-da, it's really just basically me, but <laughs> <laughs> here I am, I'm in. I'm but that's oh. probably, it may be easier for some people to remember than my name, and if I'm ever not available, it would be staffed by members of the palliative care team. But if you, if you run into a problem uh, with the management of a DNAR patient having a procedure or surgery, please feel welcome to call. If I can't help, I, may, I will almost certainly know somebody who can. These are very complicated processes, and um, I would say we are really at uh, somewhat of a leading edge in terms of trying to get this right for patients and families based on the uh, research I've done throughout and other practices throughout the country. But please feel welcome to call me or email me if you identify something that's a problem with the process that we've described, if there's a particular patient that you would like advice or recommendations on. If things are getting stuck anyway, I would really like to be able to help. Thank you, Emily. And I, I do encourage you to seek out her support. Um, it is a tricky area and it is a lot different than what everybody kind of thinks the standard practices. Um, the, the purple wristband actually came out of a serious safety event here um, that was related to a patient who did not want resuscitation, receiving resuscitative efforts. So we're all, uh, we're incorporating that, that uh, recommendation from the stakeholder group and trying to build a better process. As she said, feedback is welcome. Please let us know where you're stuck. Please let us know what doesn't work. We want to change it for the better. Thank you, Emily. Next slide, please. A couple last things just to finish with. Um, one thing is to highlight, I told you um, earlier on that we could build a process where we integrate the relationships that other folks have with patients into our serious illness conversations. This is a slide taken directly from our colleagues at Ariadne Labs that I showed you at the very beginning. They actually do their serious illness conversation training in an interdisciplinary manner so that social workers, nurses, and others can support these conversations. We are going to try to build that structure here so that some of that burden is taken off of you. You are not going to be, as the provider, the only one looked at to, to sort of do these conversations. You will have more support. You will have more help. I promise you. I've been doing it now for years. It makes it so much easier. Next slide, please. And one last plug, one last thing I'd like to highlight, just in case you are not convinced that sometimes that one-to-one -one interaction you have with one particular patient is the result of a system problem, I am hoping this slide convinces you. This paper is not from here, but it could be. I have had patients who were very brave tell me this very same thing from here. Um, there are patients here um, of, of many different backgrounds, but I think our African-American patients come to mind the most. 
um, who have uh, who have a lot of challenges in the way that we approach having these conversations. And there's a whole lot of system issues that have to do with that. And they actually are not even wrapped up in what I just described. We have a lot of work to do to explore that. I'm really grateful for everybody who's going to help us try to work on this because it's a very important part of what we do next um, as we move forward. So just to wrap up, we just have a few little things to fix and everything will be fine. <laughs> there's some work to do. We can do this. Please help us feedback, support, um, let me know what, what you're interested in doing, what you see. Um, we'd love to make this better. I do have some thank yous there, not only to Dr. Rive, but other team members who have helped a ton in this work. And with that, I think we're wrapped up. And I don't know, um, Dr. Hardigan, I'll pass the last slide to you if maybe there's one question or two we have time for. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, just a quick reminder first, if you would like more training specifically about how to initiate uh, these goals of care conversations, please email Danny directly. This is her email address here. Um, and we do have time for a question or two before we finish up. Uh, one of the questions submitted by Dr. Syme um, had to do with distinguishing between the different kinds of services that we can offer to our patients, um, particularly between palliative care and hospice. And that was also a question that we saw quite frequently in the survey that many people uh, felt like they didn't have enough information about the differences between palliative care, hospice, uh, what comfort care means to be able to start those conversations comfortably. They didn't, weren't always sure that they could answer the patient's concerns um, accurately. So would you mind commenting on the different kinds of services and level of care that can be provided to patients at end of life? Absolutely, and that's a great question. And I think one of the things is to acknowledge you're exactly right. This is, it's really complicated. There's a lot of different terms and, and there's a lot of confusion about these terms. Two things I'd like to point out. One is, is that we're often termed supportive care. I encourage you all to use that term. It is much more palatable to patients and families and other teams. We are totally fine going by supportive care. It is actually what we are doing. Um, in the future, on the second point, what I'd love to see is that that particular piece of figuring that out is not on your plate. That you can reach out to these folks in supportive care and wherever your patient is physically or mentally or psychosocially or spiritually or what have you, we are going to figure out a plan for them. And I say that because some of these models are actually more complicated than we might realize. Um, so for instance, when we instituted inpatient hospice here, some folks asked me, are we, you know, are other teams going to do this? And I wound up sitting in, you know, 482 or so meetings about inpatient hospice. And it took me a long time to learn some of these things. And that's just part of it. So I think what we want to do is be the group that everyone can lean on to help figure out where is your patient you know, not only in their, their time course of their illness, but where are they kind of emotionally, where's their family, and then help you build services around where they are for where they are now and where they need to be in the future. Anything else? Sure, one last question from, okay. the, uh, from the surveys and then we'll wrap up. Um, many of my patients and their families rely on faith when dealing with their illness. When I try to address goals of care, they tell me that God has a plan and they should not be giving up. How should I address this situation? This is a great minute and a half question. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. This is, this is one of the challenging things we face as well. And by the way, this is, I had a slide on interdisciplinary team practice here. This is why I, I practice in an interdisciplinary setting because that stuff starts happening and Jason Callahan has to come from wherever he is. You all know him. He's amazing. And come down and help me work through it, right? Because our, our chaplains actually have a lot that they do to address those things. Um, I think, you know, the easy answer in palliative is probably somewhat similar to psychiatry. Tell me more about what you're thinking about that. Tell me more about what that means to you and how you process that. Um, and then, you know, I think depending on their answers, um, I think we do have a lot of great resources here that even though I practice in palliative and I do talk to patients and families a lot about this, that I actually need resources to come behind me and help help kind of work through some of those who are very specialized in that. 
He managed to do it in a minute, Danny. <laughs> professional. All right. Well, thank you so much to all of our panelists for their presentations today. Um, as Dr. Syme is, is writing to me now, um, you know, let's keep that conversation going. Please feel free um, to reach out to me or reach out to Danny directly if you would like to be involved in this work. Um, and uh, some folks writing in saying thank you very much for, for sort of honest uh, insights from the presenters today. Uh, and most especially, I want to say thank you to our brave residents. Your perspective is so important. Uh, and thank you so much for being a part of our talk today. And thanks to our attendees. Everyone have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.